What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. I am filming in a different location today and both of my cats are in the room with me. Queen Pumpkin's up here, Clementine's back there probably figuring out ways to turn my camera off. So I'm hoping they don't go absolutely bananas this entire video. So today we're going to be speaking about the suspicious death of 34 year old Sean O'Brien who was found laying unconscious in a pool of blood in his basement apartment in 2006. His daughter was only 13 at the time of his death and now as an adult she is desperately trying to get to the bottom of what happened. She wants the truth. This is a very tricky case. Um, there's quite literally only one article online about this. Majority of the rest of the information comes from his daughter, Natalia herself, and the Facebook page that she's created. She's got a GoFundMe. She also has a website that's running to find answers. So where the police stand is kind of cloudy. It was initially believed to be a medical emergency that led to his death, but as people started digging a little bit more, mainly Sean's family, it appeared that something more possibly happened. There are persons of interest in this case. I don't know, however, if it's being investigated as a homicide or just potential foul play. I think everything is just really up in the air. And Natalia ended up reaching out to me and gave me a ton of information that she had collected. And I was able to go through everything she could possibly give me and get the information out there. But before I get into the details of today's case, I do need to say a huge thank you to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. NordVPN is a virtual private network that helps to protect your identity and personal information when you are browsing online. Connecting to hotspots when you're out and about or even connecting to your own Wi-Fi at home can unfortunately create a way for hackers to get their hands on all of your information. Take it from me. You don't want that to happen. A lot of us have passwords stored on our phone, emails, personal files, our credit card information, even down to our browsing history. That's just information you don't want someone to get their hands on. And NordVPN basically creates this like invisibility cloak that helps to keep all of that information safe. NordVPN is super easy to use. I am not tech savvy and it makes things a breeze. There's a Chrome browser extension. There's also an easy app that you can put on your phone and you quite literally press one button and all of your information is protected. And with the ability to have six simultaneous connections going on at one time, you can be sure that every device you have is covered. There's also 24 seven customer support if you have any questions or problems along with a 30 day money back guarantee. Internet safety is just as important as every other kind of safety that we speak about on this channel. And so right now NordVPN is offering my subscribers, you guys, a really awesome deal. All you have to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash Danielle to get a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk free with Nord's money back guarantee. And honestly, at this point, I've had it for, I believe like three years and it is so absolutely worth it. Thank you again to NordVPN for partnering with me on today's video. NordVPN has supported me for a very long time and give me the ability to create these videos for you guys and these families along with the victims and donate to them as much as I possibly can. So now onto the details of this case. So as I said, there's not a lot of information on this case out publicly. I just don't feel like anyone really knew what to do with the case. It was not treated properly in the beginning and that created so many holes and hurdles that are still out there to this day. And this happened back in 2006. So I only know a little bit of information about Sean himself. He grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. He was a part of a really big family and he eventually made his way to Cranston, Rhode Island, and he settled down working as a carpenter. He was well liked, he was known as a gentleman, but he unfortunately still had his struggles. He had a daughter, Natalia, at the age of 20 with a young woman named Amy, who I believe was 18 at the time. And they ended up splitting up for most of Natalia's life because of Sean's drug use and alcohol consumption. Um, it was a pretty large problem from my understanding. It was about two years old when Natalia and her mother Amy moved out and they did not reconnect until Natalia was about nine years old. So just a few years prior to his death. At this point, I believe Amy and and Sean reconnected. They tried to figure out their relationship again. And Natalia was able to have a relationship with her father as well. They were living separately at this time. 
So Sean was actually living with a friend of a friend of a friend. It was one of those really complicated situations where I think someone in the family knew this guy down the line. And this guy's name was Armand Rouleau. And his girlfriend, Lynn Halal, was also living at this home. And it was a duplex on 145 Pleasant Street in Cranston, Rhode Island. Armand had one side of the duplex and there were two different levels. He was living on the upper level. And knowing that Sean needed a place to stay, he offered up his base basement apartment and the basement apartment was pretty decent. Um, there was a living space, a separate bedroom, a nice bathroom. The only shared space in the basement was the laundry and there was also not a private entrance to the basement. So in order for Sean to get down to his apartment, he had to go in through Armand's living space in his kitchen and down the stairs. By all accounts, Armand seemed like a nice and respectable guy. He was offering up part of his home to Sean, which is kind of like a selfless thing to do, a kind thing to do. Um, it was close to the highway, so Sean was able to easily get to work. But unfortunately, as time went on, things went downhill very, very quickly. According to Sean's family, he was paying about 85% of the rent for his little apartment in the basement. And he also was having pretty awful run-ins with Armand's girlfriend, Lynn. A handful of times throughout 2005 and 2006, Lynn physically assaulted Sean and threatened to kill him. She would spread lies about Sean. She would go directly to Amy, the mother of his daughter, and say things like, he's got STDs, he has all these women over, would just kind of make up these things as like this form of entertainment for herself. It was a bunch of small things like that. It was like she enjoyed being able to get on Sean all the time. And every time Sean would confront her about this behavior, um, about the things that she would say to people about him, um, you know, or about how she would argue all the time with him, she would become even more violent and enraged over this. She would flip tables, go downstairs to his apartment, mess things up. She was always spewing threats at him. She was just a very aggressive person. And Lynn and Armand also had their own issues. So it wasn't like this was just directed at Sean. They each had a pretty lengthy criminal history. Police were called out to the home all the time for domestic dispute calls. I believe there was one like one month prior to Sean's death. It was a huge toxic place to be. Two months prior to Sean's death, Armand ended up kicking Lynn out because he was also tired of the nonsense and ended up also filing a restraining order against her. Sean told Armand during this period that he had hit his limit. He had enough and he was going to start looking for a new place to live. He was uncomfortable around Lynn. He did not want to live there anymore. He felt like he was constantly in danger, but Armand assured him that it was gonna be fine. He said, look, I already filed a restraining order against her. She can't come around here. She won't bother you anymore. But in the same breath, Armand told Sean that he wouldn't be able to do anything if she did in fact break that restraining order and come back to his house because, and I quote, she knew too much about him, whatever that means. So knowing that Armand's promises were basically empty and it was only a matter of time before Lynn came back to the home, Sean went ahead and started to look for apartments with his sister. He had three sisters and a brother and they were gonna look for an apartment together, get away from this mess, try to move on with their lives. But before they could find one, Lynn found her way back to the home. When this happened, Sean just tried to at least separate himself from the situation as much as he could. He spent as much time away from the home as possible. According to family, he was either with them or if he wasn't there, he was finding some bar or something to hang out at to kill time. Basically, so he only had to go to this house to sleep and then could get up and go to work the next day and start the cycle all over again. So that is what the plan was on Friday, July 21st, 2006. Sean got off work this day at around 3.30 p.m. and he called up Amy and said, I'm starving, just got off work. So Amy offered to bring him a sandwich to his house on 145 Pleasant Street. When she got there, he came outside, she dropped the sandwich off and they spoke briefly about their plans for later that night. There was a festival in town that they wanted to attend with their daughter. So Amy planned on being back at the house at around seven to pick him up. 
It was around 6.45 when Amy showed back up just a few hours later and she had their 13 year old daughter, Natalia, and I believe her three year old niece with her. But when they arrived, they ended up having a change of plans. Natalia had developed a really bad headache in the past little bit and she just didn't feel well enough to go. So she just wanted to go home and sleep it off. They decided that that was not a great night to try to go to this festival. So they would just go to the festival the following night when everyone felt better and could actually enjoy themselves. After a few minutes of speaking outside of the home, rearranging their plans, Sean said that he could not be in that house, that both Lynn and Armand were there and he didn't want to be there. So he asked Amy to take him to a local bar called Billy's. He didn't really want to go alone, but obviously Amy couldn't go with him. She had Natalia who wasn't feeling well and her niece. So he decided to use Amy's cell phone to call one of his sisters to see if she wanted to go and hang out with him that night. She didn't answer the phone. So he just decided to go by himself. He was dropped off at the bar at around 7 p.m. by Amy and she told him that if he needed a ride back home later on, all he had to do was give her a call. He ended up handing her about somewhere around $200. He struggled with drinking and drugs. This was not something he had fully overcome at this point in time. So he basically handed her this money saying, my intentions tonight are not to party and go crazy. So hold this money for me. I just want to have a little bit of money on me to have a few beers, you know, have a good time and then head back home. So she put the money in the glove box and watched as Sean headed into the bar. Sean never ended up calling Amy that night asking for a ride home, which wasn't really alarming because there are many other ways he could have found rides home or possibly walked home. But he also didn't call that following Saturday morning and he had a shift at work that morning at about 8 a.m. And also Amy was working that morning and the routine was that he would usually call her at around 6.30 a.m. when they both were up and trying to get ready. But at this point, she still wasn't very concerned. She believed it was possible he just had a pretty long night and was not up yet, was scrambling to get to work. So Amy ended up getting off of work a little bit early that day. She left work at around noon and she was waiting for this call from Sean about plans for the festival. So they could kind of sort things out, figure out when she was going to get him. But again, Sean never called. Still, there was no alarm. He easily could have gotten caught up at work. There was nothing for her to be worried about. So she went about her day until 6 p.m. when she received a very alarming phone call from Sean's sister. Sean's sister, Karen, called Amy frantically and said that Sean had just been rushed to Rhode Island Hospital. At around just before 6 p.m., she said that she had arrived at Sean's home on Pleasant Street to go and see him, something that was pretty common. His family members frequently stopped by the house to hang out with him and talk to him. And as she approached the house, Armand came running outside around the corner and screamed, come quick, Sean's been in a seizure for over an hour. Seizures was not something that was uncommon for Sean. He had had quite a few in his past. I don't know if he was epileptic or if there was something else that was causing these seizures, if they were possibly just related to the drugs he was using. I'm entirely unsure, but either way, it wasn't out of the ordinary. But what was odd was that Armand said that he had been in a seizure for an hour, which is an incredibly long time for someone to have a seizure. And also he had not called 911 or done anything. So Karen ran into the downstairs apartment and found Sean unconscious on the floor of his basement apartment. He was in his bedroom, only in boxers. He was face down with his feet pointed towards the door and he was kind of wedged between his bed and his dresser and there was a pool of blood beneath his head. Because of the state of Sean and the pool of blood beneath his head and the way that she was very quickly taking in the scene, Karen asked Armand if there had been some sort of fight because that's what it looked like. And Armand immediately told her that there hadn't been. So at this point, after over an hour of him allegedly having a seizure, Karen called 911 to get him some help. Officer Gallagher and Officer Parker were the first to arrive after the fire department. And by the time they got there, Sean was already on one of the backboards being carried up the stairs to hopefully go into an ambulance and to the hospital. 
Officer Parker noted that he didn't see any marks or injuries or anything like that upon very quickly looking at Sean before making his way downstairs to look at the scene. He did report that when he walked into the basement apartment, there didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. There weren't things that were, you know, thrown to the side or messed up. The entire apartment appeared in order. He did report that there were a few spots of blood on the bed, but he said that they likely came from Sean's mouth because he had been told that Sean had bit the inside of his mouth while he was seizing, which again is not something entirely uncommon. It was noted by EMS that Sean had blood coming out of his right ear and at least some portion of it, if not all of it, was dried. He had labored breathing, his pupils were non-reactive. They noted that it may be a possible overdose because Sean did in fact have a history of drug abuse. Uh, so they decided to go ahead and administer Narcan twice. From what they wrote down, there was no response. Officer Parker then spoke to Armand to try to figure out all of the events leading up to this alleged seizure and try to figure out what exactly is going on. And Armand told Officer Parker that he had seen Sean at about 5 p.m. that day, so an hour prior to 911 being called. He claimed that Sean was downstairs totally fine watching a baseball game on TV. He said a little while after that, he went down for a second time and noticed that Sean was on the floor and he thought that Sean was just sleeping. Then a little bit before 6 p.m., so a little bit after that, he said that Karen showed up and at that point, he noticed that Sean was still on the floor and told Karen that he wasn't sure if Sean was sleeping or if he was actually seizing. Authorities went to speak to the neighbors as well and the neighbors did confirm that they did not hear anything at all out of the ordinary over the past few hours. They had been at home the entire time. So at this point, authorities decided not to seal off the scene as a potential crime scene. They had spoken to Armand, they had spoken to the neighbors. I believe at this point, Karen had left, um, but they just decided it wasn't a crime. This was a medical incident and Sean was sent off to Rhode Island Hospital. As soon as Sean got to Rhode Island Hospital, he was rushed into emergency surgery. He had a 9.7 centimeter by 3.3 centimeter hemorrhage in his brain. And so they had to immediately remove this blood clot and start to relieve some of the pressure. He was also intubated and he would never regain consciousness at this point. Amy stayed at the hospital with Sean that night and was expressing concern to her sister over the phone, who ended up being very worried something more was going on to the story. So Amy's sister ended up calling the Cranston Police Department and begging them to look into the case further. Amy stayed until about 2 a.m. before she headed home to freshen up, get some food, and came back the following day at around 7 a.m., she stated this was the point where she really started to question everything she had been told so far. It was now Sunday, the 23rd of July, and she was getting a much closer look at Sean as he laid in the ICU. A lot of the shock had worn off. Um, things weren't as fresh and frantic. So she was having a chance to kind of sit down and assess the situation. And she noticed a lot of things that alarmed her. Sean had a deep scratch on his upper chest. He also had bruising on the opposite side of his chest. His knees appeared bruised. He had some deep cuts between his toes. He also had what appeared to be either open cuts or wounds on his face. I believe it was like right here at the tip of his nose and on his forehead. And part of his tooth was missing. And he also had wounds on his knuckles that almost looked like defensive wounds. So to her, it appeared as if he had been possibly dragged by someone or at least had a really hard, hard frontal fall. He also had what appeared to be a dent on the left side of his head. And according to what doctors found, he also had a fracture on the right side of his head just behind his ear. So it was like the entirety of his head was damaged, front, sides, back, everything. And if it had been some sort of fall forward, you wouldn't have those kinds of injuries necessarily. So Amy decided to call in a nurse and ask for the toxicology report. And I believe the nurse brought that as well as the CT scan. I have not personally seen any of the toxicology reports, but according to what family has said, he had no drugs in his system 
or alcohol in his system when he went into the hospital. Um, he did have, I believe, very high doses of Tylenol though, to the point where they believed he may have had an overdose from Tylenol. CT scan also showed exactly how much damage was done to Sean's skull. And the nurse said that there is absolutely no way a fall from having a seizure, just standing up or anything like that could possibly cause those kinds of injuries. Uh, it was more consistent with him taking a blow to the head. The doctors at this point pretty much agreed and told the family that this was not a fall from a seizure. They weren't even sure if he had a seizure, but again, was likely the result of foul play. But for some reason, that message never got to authorities. I don't know why the hospital didn't tell authorities. I don't know if the family ever mentioned it to authorities, but either way, that message never went through. That same day, Sean's sister, Erin, decided to go to the apartment to speak to Armand herself to ask him what happened. Armand told Aaron that he worked that Saturday, the 22nd. He said that he left the same time in the morning as Lynn. And he also said that he believed Sean did in fact go to work that day as well. When he arrived home later, he said that he went downstairs to wash his bedding. And when he went down there is when he noticed Sean was laying down. So he totally didn't mention anything about Sean sitting down watching this baseball game. And he told Aaron that right off the bat, he assumed that Sean was having a seizure, but he didn't come back and check on him for some reason for an hour after this. He also told Aaron that Amy had dropped Sean off that Friday night and that Sean came in the house by himself, never went out again, and no one else came to the house either. So not a single part of that story really makes sense at all because first of all, Amy never dropped Sean off at the house. She had come and see him that Friday, the 21st, two separate times, but the only place she dropped Sean off was to the bar at 7 p.m. Also, instead of saying he came downstairs and saw Sean watching a baseball game and it was totally fine, he said that the first time he came downstairs, Sean was actually already on the floor face down having a seizure, not that he believed Sean was asleep. He also made it a big point to state that once Sean was dropped off by Amy that Friday night, which never even happened, that Sean came inside by himself and never left, but also stated that the next morning, Sean got up and went to work. So, so is he saying that Sean was home that whole entire 24 hours before he was found or did he go to work because it can't be both. During their conversation, Armand also told Aaron that he, for some reason, had grabbed some of Sean's money off of Sean's table down in the basement apartment. And he didn't really explain why he took it, but he started frantically looking for it in cabinets and drawers. And his nephew, John, was there at the time. He started asking John if he knew where it was. And eventually he ended up going into his bedroom and coming back out with $70. So the whole situation just was a little bit odd. Erin then went downstairs to check out Sean's bedroom and see things for herself. And she noticed that all of Sean's bedding had been thrown onto the couch. And there were multiple areas across the apartment where you could clearly see blood. So after seeing this briefly and also hearing Armand's very strange story, she decided to call the police department herself to say, look, something's off. He's saying very weird things that don't make sense. Please look into this case further. That same day later on, Sean's brother Danny also called the police department begging them to do something. Now, the following day, Monday, the 24th of July, Sean's family was informed by the doctors the severity of his injuries. So they had to make the very difficult decision to remove him from life support. He was taken off at 5 p.m. that day. He did continue to breathe on his own for a while, but he remained unconscious. And the following day, Tuesday, the 25th, he passed away. The family kind of knew this was coming. They had been prepared for about two days at this point. They were able to spend time with Sean. They were religious, so they had people there praying over him. Um, they took all of the different steps that they needed to. And after Sean passed away, Ellen, his mom, went ahead to call a funeral home to begin arranging his funeral. And as soon as she called the funeral home, she was told that Sean's body had already been claimed by the medical examiner's office. 
So at this point, Sean's family is thinking, finally, they're going to look into this because this doesn't make any sense. Um, and they thought they would get some answers, but they also were very well aware of the fact that it had been five days since anyone in the family had seen him and four days since this potential crime scene had been just left sitting. At this point, Aaron and Amy decided to go back to the house. I don't believe Amy had a chance up to this point to go and check everything out herself. So she wanted to go and see it and speak to Armand. So around 6 p.m. when they got there, Armand met them outside along with his golden retriever, Floyd. They informed Armand that unfortunately, Sean had passed away that day. And they told him that based on his injuries and what doctors said, it appeared as if someone hit him over the head. Immediately, Armand panicked and said, oh no, no, that is absolutely impossible. Sean was having seizures all the time. That is what happened. Again, they asked Armand, you know, if he heard anything or saw anything the night of the 21st and into the early morning hours of the 22nd. And Armand began recanting his story again that Amy had dropped Sean off that night. And immediately Amy stopped him in his tracks and said, I never dropped him off that night. I don't know why you're telling people this. I came to see him at around 6.45, 7 p.m. that night, and then I dropped him off at the bar. So as soon as Armand heard Amy say this, that she had not dropped him off that night, he completely changed his story. All of a sudden, he stated that he was actually out in the yard of his home, and at around 8 p.m. that night, Sean came walking around the corner with a bag of beers under his arm. So, I mean, total flip of the switch. I mean, those stories are not even remotely similar, but he totally changed everything that he said. And he was also asking questions after every single one of his statements. He was saying things like, he had a beard, or did he? He was wearing a white hat, I think, right? He did, in fact, confirm still, though, that when Sean showed back up at the house with a bag of beer under his arm, that he went into the house by himself. He never left the house, and no one else came to the house. Amy and Aaron immediately turned their attention to Floyd, the golden retriever. According to Amy, Floyd and Sean were basically inseparable. Despite the fact that Floyd was not Sean's dog, Floyd spent majority of the time downstairs in the basement with Sean. Um, he actually also was able to alert people when Sean would have seizures. He was very protective over him. As I stated, family came frequently to see Sean and they would typically knock on his basement window to get him to come up and let them men. Sean did not have a cell phone, so that was kind of their way of communicating. And without fail, Floyd would always bark and lose his mind. So Aaron and Amy were kind of shocked that, you know, if someone hit Sean over the head or, you know, something that Floyd never made any noise. The neighbors never heard him freak out. No one heard anything. And also Ellen, Sean's mom, had been over early in the morning on Saturday and was knocking on the door to try to speak to Sean. And she didn't remember hearing Floyd bark either, which was something they were all accustomed to. Armand immediately said that this was something that was totally explainable. He said that every single Saturday, he scrubbed the bathtub. Floyd was actually in the bathroom with him when he was scrubbing it, and that's why Floyd wasn't there to bark. So as you can see, this just also throws more confusion into the entire story because he has said to multiple people, including authorities, that he went to work that Saturday, but now he's also saying he wasn't at work earlier on in the day. He was actually scrubbing his bathroom like he does every single Saturday. It just, was he cleaning? Was he working? His stories are all just all over the place. And to throw yet another wrench as if there weren't already plenty in Armand's story, Charlene, another one of Sean's sisters, had driven by the home at around 11 a.m. that Saturday the 22nd and specifically remembered seeing Armand and Lynn's cars parked in the driveway. At this point, Amy and Aaron went down to Sean's room. They wanted to collect a few of his belongings and told Armand they would come back at a later date to fully clear out the apartment. And they also wanted to get a much better look at this room because Amy, again, I don't think had been in the room at all since. And the scene that they walked into was shocking. 
There was a stain of blood on the carpet right in front of his bedroom door. There was also blood on the bedroom door itself. It seemed like so many things had been changed around since Aaron and Karen had both been down in the apartment over the last week. I believe all of the trash cans had been emptied. Karen said that the countertops had been totally clear of anything when she was down there the Saturday that she found Sean. But at this point, there were many dishes covering the countertops. There were also blood stains on the bedroom carpet. Comforter that had been seen on the couch was now thrown onto Sean's bed and when they pulled this comforter away it was balled around something and it ended up being balled around a bloody sheet and a bloody pillowcase. They also noticed that three pillows were just entirely missing from the bed itself. There was also a long green dark green body pillow that was there and there were spots of blood on that. There was a bloody shirt and it appeared that this shirt was actually used to possibly wipe something up. In Sean's bathroom there was also blood there was vomit in the toilet, what appeared to be a bloody handprint in the bathroom, or at least just bloody fingerprints. One of the kitchen chairs also had a shirt draped over it, and when they picked the shirt up, it was hiding a blood stain. So many things around the entire house where there was blood, it had been covered by something else as if it was an attempt to hide it. There were also three pretty sizable pools of blood on the mattress. They found a beer can that had been cut down the middle, exposing a very jagged edge. There was also a strange piece of paper in his apartment. And on one side of the paper, it was very clearly Armand's handwriting. And it said Armand and John with their phone numbers beside it. And then on the very back was Sean's handwriting. And it appeared that he had jotted down a license plate number reading QV218. And that was just kind of strange. He would not have written that down unless it had some sort of significance. They also found Sean's shorts and his shoes that he had been wearing that night that Amy dropped him off at the bar. The shorts even still had his ID in it, which really said to them that he never made it to work the following morning. They also found Sean's belt and his hammer holder on the table, which was another place he would typically put things to set it up to wake up, grab it and go. But his hammer was missing from that pile of items. The only other thing that they could find that was missing in the apartment was a pretty heavy, big brass lamp. So at this point, they're starting to connect so many things and a lot of the puzzle was slowly beginning to come together. Sean never walked around in just his boxers unless he was literally immediately getting into bed. He was very modest, even in his own apartment because there was technically a shared space. He always remained clothed. Pair that with his shortened shoes still being there as if he had just gotten home from the bar and his stuff laid out for work the next day. It was clear that whatever did happen to him did not happen to him just prior to Karen finding him, it seemed more likely that something happened to Sean late in the night of the 21st into the early morning hours of the 22nd. Erin pulled out her phone and began taking pictures because keep in mind, authorities have not processed this as a crime scene at all. And during all of this, John, Armand's nephew, came downstairs and began to speak to both Aaron and Amy about what had happened to Sean. They explained to him, just like they told Armand, that Sean had passed away that day. And they also told him that it appeared as if he had been struck in the head by something. And they asked John if he had been at the house the night of the 21st because it was very possible someone attacked Sean. He said he wasn't there and then followed that up with Sean didn't have any problems with Armand, end quote. Then he left. So for very, very obvious reasons, Amy decided to go to the Cranston Police Department the following day, Wednesday the 26th at 9.30 a.m. She spoke to them about the state of the case. She expressed all of her frustrations and the fact that her family had repeatedly called and tried to get them to do something that the hospital believed there was foul play involved. This did not add up to a seizure and a fall. And then the fact that they saw these strange things at the apartment. She also expressed all of her suspicions and the strange stories that Armand had told her. The sergeant immediately pointed the finger at the hospital saying they would have done something more had they been notified that this was likely a homicide due to his injuries. But Amy kind of stood her ground and was like, the hospital knew that, that's fine but we also told you there was an issue. Why didn't you follow up with the hospital to see what exactly was going on? Ultimately, police agreed that something was not right and this was potentially a homicide and foul play may have been involved. So they went to seal off the apartment as a potential crime scene. But 
a little too late. We already know that Aaron had gone into the apartment twice. Karen had gone into the apartment. Amy had gone into the apartment. When they went, there were other obvious signs that someone else had been down in the apartment messing with things, moving things, moving dishes, emptying trash, possibly cleaning things up. So all possible evidence was at this point contaminated. Armand was brought into the police station on either the 26th or the 27th, I'm not exactly sure what day, to be interviewed by Detective Hall, who had been put onto the case. But before anything could be said, Armand asked for a lawyer and refused to speak. He did, however, consent to having his house searched, so the detectives and other officers followed him home. And when they got there, the searches began and they ended up going to speak to Lynn, who was at the house at the time. They hoped that she maybe would have some answers or maybe could corroborate what Armand had been saying since so far his stories have been all over the place. They asked Lynn if Armand had mentioned anything to her about what he saw, the position he saw Sean in the first time he went down to the basement. As soon as they asked Lynn this, Armand butted in. He said that he wanted to answer the question and the detective had to tell him, look, you have already told me that you will not speak to me without a lawyer. I legally cannot speak to you about this without one, so you cannot answer this question. So he again asked Lynn, who said that she couldn't recall. So then he asked, did Armand mention how he saw Sean in the apartment the second time he went down there? And again, Armand butted in and wanted to answer the question. And so at this point, the detective said, I've already told you, you cannot speak to me about this without a lawyer. And he ended up saying, you know what? I changed my mind. I want to talk to you. And so they ended up both being interviewed. I don't know much about the interview. The police report did not mention much of what they said at all. I know their written statements were in fact taken, but I was not able to see those. But what I do know was that during this interview, Detective Hall noticed scratches on Armand's face. And he questioned Armand about this. And as soon as he did that, Lynn stepped up and confessed, saying that they had gotten into an argument Friday night, the 21st, the same night it's believed that Sean possibly was attacked. And she said she was the one who put the scratches on his face and it was entirely unrelated to everything else. Now, obviously, between that and having a restraining order against her and still being at Armand's house, she also was arrested for simple domestic assault charges. I don't know how much information came from both Armand and Lynn. I don't know if he kept up with his same story. He seemed pretty adamant to speak for Lynn herself about what he saw when he went down into the basement. Um, and that same exact day, Sean's family happened to pass by the police department and noticed that CSI was out processing Lynn's car. So they believed an arrest would come soon because to them, none of this made sense. The only explanation was that something had happened to him, that finally it was the straw that broke the camel's back, that all of the threats against Sean from Lynn, um, all of the issues between Lynn and Armand, that everything came to a head and something happened. But unfortunately, no arrests were ever made. Authorities have stated that they have investigated to the best of their abilities. Uh, they did find that Sean never showed up to work that Saturday. So the family's gut feeling that something happened over the night, Friday night into Saturday morning, was pretty much confirmed through this. Um, I feel like that also kind of makes sense since he did have dry blood on his ear. I saw that and immediately felt that he had not just been laying there for an hour at that point. Um, they also were able to find that Armand also did not go to work that Saturday, despite the fact that he told numerous people that he did. And then when the Emmy report came back, it showed that Sean did in fact die due to blunt force trauma to the head. However, his manner of death could not be determined. There was nothing there that made the medical examiner feel confident enough to say that this was in fact a homicide. So it was all just left undetermined. Sean had in fact suffered from a skull fracture. There were lots of different lacerations and bruises and all sorts of things on his body. As I said, there was also the evidence of a possible struggle on his knuckles. The autopsy report also spoke about the healing wounds on his face. So at least all of that is documented. However, it just didn't do what his family was hoping it would. The talk screen also came back showing that cocaine was in his system, which he was known to use cocaine and heroin and abuse alcohol. So that's not really anything out of the ordinary and Lord have mercy, people are going to go at me in the comments, but I don't know much about drugs, but I'm fairly certain that Narcan will not do anything 
If you have overdosed on cocaine, let me know if I'm wrong down below. Um, so I feel like if that had been a possibility, the Narcan wouldn't have done anything to begin with. Um, I don't know if that could explain the possible vomit in the toilet. Maybe that triggered a seizure. I have absolutely no idea. Or it's just something that is entirely unrelated because he was known to use cocaine. The owner of Billy's was also spoken to to confirm that Sean had in fact gone into the bar that night and he did confirm that Sean was there, but he wasn't sure exactly when Sean left. Sean's family also has done as much as they can to look into this and figure out what happened. So they went back to speak to the neighbor on the other side of the duplex and she told them that she didn't remember hearing anything odd. Once again, the few hours before he allegedly seized on that Saturday, but she does remember hearing something after Sean was already in the hospital. She claimed that on the 24th or the 25th and the 25th was the day that Sean ended up passing away. She said that she heard Lynn and Armand in the basement. So in Sean's living space while he was in the hospital arguing, she heard glass breaking, she heard screaming. And then a little while after that, she could very unfortunately clearly hear sounds of intercourse. So they were literally having sex in his bed as he was in the hospital after having a giant argument. One thing that does bother me, however, is that authorities only asked the neighbor if she heard anything the hours prior to the seizure. But according to all the evidence and what it really suggests, it seems like something happened in the middle of the night. And I feel like it's not as likely someone heard that as in the middle of the day. Police did remove multiple items from the home to put into evidence. They also chased down as many leads as possible. I believe they did get one tip that said that the lamp that was missing from the home ended up in a landfill. I've also seen it stated in an article that there was also a whole love seat that was missing from the home that also may have ended up in the landfill, but I've only seen that on one the one source there is out there. So I'm not entirely sure how true that is. But when they went and tried to search this down, obviously landfills are huge. They just did not find anything. The hammer, as I stated, was also missing. And I don't believe they ever found that either, which is super frustrating because both of those items could potentially be a murder weapon. Because the crime scene was contaminated and Armand got a lawyer and refused to speak, which he did end up getting one and would not say anything to police, um, they really had nothing to push the case forward. So you can see why Sean's daughter is so frustrated. The home should have been sealed as a crime scene right away. The residents of the home had very long criminal histories, both of them. There was domestic violence in the home. They had literally come out to a call just a month prior. One of the times when Lynn threatened Sean's life, said she was going to kill him and hit him in the face. They even had a police come out to one of those. So police were aware that Lynn had threatened Sean's life. But for some reason, knowing all of that, knowing the history of the individuals involved, nobody questioned why Armand left Sean face down on the floor naked in a pool of blood for an hour allegedly seizing. It honestly boggles my mind. A few theories have been put out there in support of the seizure. Um, I know that the Emmy and police did suggest it was possible that he may be seized while coming down the stairs and that this may have caused him to fall down the stairs, explaining why there were so many different injuries on his head. They believe that after this, he may have gotten up and tried to make it to his bed, but due to his different injuries, he ended up falling unconscious. Nobody reported hearing Sean fall. This also put with the timeline and the fact that this likely happened overnight on Friday night. This also doesn't support Armand's statement that he saw Sean alive and well watching a baseball game on Saturday. Um, and again, Sean never went anywhere in his underwear because he lived with two people, one of them making him super uncomfortable. So it, that just didn't make sense. A forensic pathologist has also looked into this separately and stated that they do not believe Sean just simply fell on the floor from having a seizure. This forensic pathologist said, and I quote, when a person does fall, their injuries are typically just one-sided. They don't fall, 
hit the ground, turn over, hit the ground again, turn over, and then hit the ground again. They hit the ground once, creating one injury. And this does not match with the multiple bruises, lacerations, and head wounds that Sean suffered from. Natalia has started a website for her father, a Facebook page. There's also a GoFundMe that has been set up to help solve her dad's case. The case is in fact still open, but it's just nothing is really being done with it. And Natalia hopes that bringing this case to the media might help it get the attention it deserves and possibly someone will bring forward information or it will help her get in touch with experts that are willing to lend a hand. She is using all of the GoFundMe donations to pay for different experts to look at all of the information in her father's case. She wants as many people to look at it with unbiased eyes as possible. She has made it very clear that she will accept whatever the truth is as long as it's the truth, whether that means this was a homicide or even if it really was just some bizarre medical accident. She will accept either one of those. She's not trying to push this as a homicide. She wants the truth. And as of right now, all of the information that is there just doesn't really add up and has left them with a lot of suspicions and a lot of questions. Very interested to see your opinions down below. And I know that a lot of you guys have either medical experience or you know more than I do on a lot of these different topics. So I always look forward to cases like this because you guys offer so much of your own personal knowledge to explain a lot of these things. Thank you again to every single one of you for taking the time out of your day to listen to Sean's story. It means so much to me and it also means so much to all of the families that come to me asking me to share their story. A lot of the times these people have had to scream from the rooftops to get even one person to hear and I'm so thankful that you guys have helped get me to a position where I am able to project their voices even further so that more people can hear the story, more people can understand what they've been going through and more people can offer ways to help. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam so that hopefully we can bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.